just so that you and we have a recording now of this session artificial intelligence where do we go from here so those are great questions so far i'm hoping maybe we'll get some more maybe a little bit later and uh we have a uh, a few topics to get through tonight, so let's see what we can do. Okay. Artificial intelligence, where do we go from here? Okay, as for those of you particularly who were here the last time, you know we talked about this, that uh, AI is not new. AI has been there um, for nearly 70, 80 years probably, coming out of some of the efforts at code breaking and so on during the um, Second World War. But the thing about AI was that it had to wait for the development of algorithms beyond what they used to be. So we all remember algorithms probably from our school days, and how they could um, solve arguments and, and, and um, represent logic. Um, these uh, equations um, were further developed by mathematicians who wanted machines to be able to have a way of in those days, it wasn't quite reasoning, but differentiating between patterns. So if you want to break a code, uh, somebody is using a jumbled up sequence of letters, numbers, whatever, to uh, stop you from understanding what they're talking about. One of the things you need is a machine that can see the patterns. Uh, so a lot of it goes back to those guys who were the code breakers for the allies back in those days, and um, the real breakthrough comes not necessarily from the machines that followed on from that, because they were quite rudimentary. They were more about um, looking at, looking back at historical business data and summarizing it for you. Um, but in the mid to late 60s to early 70s when we started having computer chips that could run millions and millions of computations very fast this is the reason why we began to have what today we are calling ai artificial intelligence it really had to wait until the physical technology was able to catch up with the ideas many of which had only been theories prior to now. And so um, when you have the ability to give um, computational equipment rules and understanding that this is different from that, then you can begin to teach machines and what they call machine learning. And first, and the first applications are in factories, um, car factories, particularly fairly simple, straightforward stuff, um, recognizing what part of a car had arrived and where it needed to be welded and those kinds of things. But gradually this has become much more sophisticated. We began to have the neural networks. Neural networks began to try and learn from the way the human brain thinks and understands. And deep learning, which by its very name, tells us that the machines now were able to have a much greater depth of understanding or, or of um, computing of the um, facts that they were being fed. And these, um, these are all some of the background to the AI that we have today. But 
The explosion now is so enormous, largely again driven by technology. And a little bit later tonight, I'll be talking about some of those, just a little bit of the technical side of things. Um, it's absolutely amazing what is happening. Um, and many of us don't realize what we are carrying in our pocket when we have a mobile phone. Um, the amount of... Um, computing power and the combination of technologies, you, you know, the, the camera, the phone, the two-way radio, all the kinds of things, all in there. Okay, so Dr. Soha Rawas, um, who is in, uh, um, in uh, Doha, I think, um, says this, that the availability of large data sets is combined with the technical resources to produce all of this. So gradually we've good. accumulated so much data, but, but we would not have been able to deal with that data um, yes. until we had these kinds of machines. Okay, let's take some examples of what AI is doing. So AI in logistics, logistics makes the world go round. So I picked this as an example um, because everything we have around us had to pass through logistics to reach us. Um, and we all saw what happened when there was uh, an incident in um, the uh, Suez Canal when a ship got stuck or what has been happening with um, the attacks on some ships there, prices all over the world shoot up and all kinds of things happen. There's a company called uh, Codept, and this is what you'll see if you get to their website. I just put that there so that you could recognize it, those of you who will be interested. And here is their, um, here's their uh, web address, codept.de. So obviously they're somewhere in Germany, probably, uh, originally. And... Um, they talk about how AI is streamlining uh, operations, uh, order processing, inventory management, supply chain, distribution. Every area of logistics is being affected by this. It comes down to the same principle. The machines can recognize the patterns. They can see where efficiencies could be found. They can process the uh, material, the um, information, what we, we call the data, much faster than any human being could hope to. Some of the key areas are in predictive maintenance, fulfillment optimization, route optimization, inventory management, demand forecasting, and there are others uh, we won't be able to, to do them all today. Predictive maintenance. This is the idea that AI will be predicting every spare part, every aspect of uh, a machinery and its support systems. So it knows in advance how many hours and you know that um, certain components can last and it can tell you that by March of next year, you're going to have to replace this vehicle or it has to go in for a major uh, turnaround um, in the workshop. Uh, things like this are revolution, revolutionizing um, very large companies and those who have uh, very major projects on their hands. That would have been impossible because the amount of data could not be easily processed by a human being. There might have been maybe a thousand people or more in a warehouse somewhere with uh, calculators and their pen and their paper trying to figure these things out. But now you put them into the machine and it tells you straight away. This is uh, Amazon, um, Amazon robots. Um, I don't know if you can hear the sound. You can see the robots are moving everything themselves. No human being in there. They're moving with absolute precision.
And there goes another batch of items that have to be uh, dispatched. Maybe what you ordered from Amazon is inside one of these. It's quite amazing. And um, this is the future um, that we uh, are seeing. So I wonder what you thought when you saw that movie. Um, maybe somebody would like to say something. Uh, what, what, did, what, what, what are your thoughts um, seeing something like that? Where there's a, a warehouse um, without people. And uh, what might that be telling us? Any comments? Well, I'd say once again that it depends on what you're trying to do. There are certain uh, types of industry that we really need to be thinking about how we give jobs to people. But there are other things that we need to do where we need to maximize the efficiency, maximize the outcome, and use that outcome in order to do other things that people can benefit from. I think that this is an amazing example of human ingenuity. And um, the only difficulty I have with that and a lot of the other developments is that behind it all, there's a huge consumption of electricity, huge consumption of other um, resources. So the global warming, the atmospheric and wider environmental pollution and so on would be considerable. People tell me that it is easier to have um, uh, an, it's easier and cheaper to have an electric car. But if you look at the average electric car, the amount of resource that it has taken to to build it um, because it's being maybe subsidized at the moment and you're buying it at that cheap cost, what is the real cost to humanity? And what is the real cost to the environment of each electric car that is being produced? You know, so there are some questions still when I see things like that. I um I still think we have not yet balanced the equation, but perhaps in the future, you know, every emerging technology is always very expensive and not necessarily environmentally friendly. It depends how it is handled uh, so that um, hopefully over time things improve. And, um, but I do have my questions about some of these kinds of uh, technologies. So that's my take on that, that we need to think of the total cost and the reason why that particular technology is to be applied in that particular situation. Not because it is the latest thing that someone has brought from Europe or America. Do we really need it? If we need it, why do we need it? What can it really do for us? And you remember the story I told you of the chief executive on the golf course. Route optimization. Well, if you've ever driven with a GPS, you know that GPS tries to use the signals of other GPS devices to warn you if there is congestion on a particular route and take you on a faster route. So you would have noticed that. Uh, the, um, major companies like uh, the DHL. Could you mute your mic, please? If you're not speaking to us, please mute your mic. Um, some of these conferences, we have unfortunately been allowed to hear some things that maybe those who were speaking did not want us to hear. Don't be a victim. Okay. 
um, if you are DHL and you have thousands and thousands of vehicles on the road at any given time, a system that can help you minimize the delays and maximize the productivity of those vehicles is something that you would certainly want to have as part of your business plan. So route optimization for various transport systems, particularly for logistics companies, is another area where AI is making a huge, huge impact. So this is one area where quietly behind the scenes, without us being so aware of it, this is one area where AI is making a positive impact. The early systems were not that good, but gradually they are learning from their mistakes. They are improving. And as we go through tonight, we'll look at a few other areas where AI um, is improving and some areas where so far it is not. Some other AI positives. So we'll have a sh very short break shortly, five minutes or so. In business and finance, automating routine tasks, again, analyzing huge amounts of data, and also for security in finance. Um, because again, we said that the AI is good at recognizing patterns. So it can alert humans. It can't um, do the work itself, but it could alert the humans to say, this transaction looks very different from all the other transactions. Have you ever tried to do something at your bank or maybe use a bank card somewhere where you have never been before and immediately the, the, the computer system asks you either for some more verification or even stops you? It wasn't a person. It was the AI that was recognizing that this is an unusual pattern. You get paid every end of the month if you're a salaried person and you do your shopping and so on and so on, now suddenly your card is doing some shopping somewhere um, in uh, the middle of the month and uh, it's spending, no, it's not buying the kind of things you normally buy, it will flag it up. Why? Because it's recognizing the patterns. AI thrives on patterns, okay? Um, in finance, um, they're using um, AI for, for trading on the stock markets, being able to know which shares are moving up, moving down, and so on. Um, it's something that I've wondered about. I had some shares many years ago. I checked recently. It, it looks like they're still where they were when I bought them. So I might need some help from AI. Education, we, we looked at uh, earlier on, just before we started recording, uh, we, we saw how there's a lot of impact in education and educational institutions are really having to grapple with this. When you receive an essay from a student, did they write it? Did AI write it? Is it by them or it's by ChatGPT or Claude AI or as the case might be? So these are very real uh, issues, um, which um, a lot of educational institutions are having to grapple with. In fact, uh, many of them have purchased uh, many of them have purchased uh, uh, AI systems themselves. Particularly, the larger universities now have AI systems that check the input from students to see if what the students are submitting is written by AI or written by the students. So it's it's getting quite interesting. Um, and as we noted earlier, the AI uh, manufacturers, uh, manufacturers have turned around to offer the students uh, more AI that could help them 
uh, help them write the essay so that the university AI cannot tell that it was AI that wrote what the student wrote. You see what I mean? It is getting very complicated. But there are many other areas where AI is having an impact uh, in creative industries. Um, you can now ask AI to help you edit a film, um, to provide text and images. We talked earlier about how if you are using um, social media, maybe for your uh, uh, church or ministry or your company, how you can use AI to generate some of your social media posts and things like that. Uh, musicians are now having to prove that the song that they wrote was not written by AI and so on. So there's a huge revolution that is taking place. The question is, how do we deal with it? And we are going to learn more about that tonight. So another major area is what AI can do for us in terms of um, environmental um, degradation, um, conservation, um, the effects of climate change, uh, industrial pollutions, um, and some of the other global challenges. If you don't have this little book, AI in Africa, please get it. I know as things have moved on a bit, but in there you will still find a lot of information about areas in Africa where AI has been able to help predict so many things. Um, uh, the arrival of particular uh, seasonal diseases and uh, to alert the healthcare agencies, not in terms of who and who is going to get sick, but knowing the pattern um, of where is likely to be concentrations of meningitis, for example, in a particular year, because all of the factors that lead up to the outbreak have been fed into the machine. And from the millions of computing points, it's able to make a prediction. Uh, it, it's been able to look at um, floods and other uh, issues and say, you know, how and when uh, disaster is more likely to occur so that uh, people can start now to put um, things in place maybe six months ahead, nine months ahead, and so on. So um, there are a lot of things happening um, across Africa um, with AI. And um, a lot may be things that we've not heard of. So please do. It's um, quite a reasonably priced book. Um, but as I say, if you are in Nigeria, particularly if you are in Bayelsa State, you can find a copy at the Azaiki Public Library. As I do say, that is one of my favorite libraries in the world. Um, you find several of my books in there, and I'm very grateful to uh, Professor Steve Azaiki um, for his patronage of knowledge. Um, and um, I believe he can hear us tonight. There's a cause coming up that I want to tell us about. Anyway, Archbishop, 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 I just want to say I'm I'm right in here and I'm listening to everything and I appreciate your comment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Um, very nice to hear your voice. And uh, once again, congratulations um, for the forethought of putting that library uh, in Yenagoa. Uh, we have to appreciate you for that and for many other things, but for that in particular. Yes, so coming up soon is this spectacular and most strategically important training for particularly for those who are leaders in the church or in ministries of various kinds who want to really look at this idea of the digital church does it really exist is it a myth is it real and if so how can we 
use it best for what we've been called to do. So my good friend, Bishop Duke Kamisoko, who is the Bishop of Kubwa in Abuja, uh, the Anglican Bishop of Kubwa and myself, we're putting this together. It will be out soon. So here is an email. If you are interested, drop me an email or maybe just inbox me or uh, message me um, tonight and I'll make sure that we get the details to you. The digital church. Does church need to go digital? And if so, how does church go digital and become a digital church? Is it how many computers we have or how many websites or how much social media? Uh, all of these kinds of questions we are going to be answering um, by the grace of God. So join us and be a part of that. Uh, we wanted to let you know about it. It's a two-day online intensive and I'll be speaking. Uh, Bishop Duke will be speaking, but other experts will be joining us. And um, I believe um, some of the Anglican clergy will be there as well. These are the modules that we'll be covering, theology, science, uh, church, uh, church as a digital organization. Is that a reality or not? Uh, digital communications in ministry, digital missionary, and so many other interesting topics. It will be coming up soon. Uh, please do book your place. Digital Church, myth or reality. I want to see you there. Are there any questions or comments at this point? We've covered quite a lot of ground. Um, and I think we're going to have just a five minutes for people maybe to uh, be able to feel a bit comfortable. And um, we have lots, lots, lots more to share with you. So don't go away. I'm going to leave the channel open and feel free to drop a question or a comment in the chat if you've not done so already. Um, or shall we say that when we... Let's take the five minutes, and then when we come from that, um, we'll take any questions quickly. Then we want to look at the future. Where are we going now with um, AI? See you very shortly. Yeah, get your questions ready. I would like to hear your thoughts. Maybe um, let's see if we can uh, 
come up with some solutions. I uh, really want to apologize again that we started so late and we had to move from Facebook over here. So um, apologies for that. And um, it does mean that uh, maybe we'll need uh, maybe an extra 15 minutes or something like that at the end. Uh, please bear with us. Okay, so do we have any questions, any comments, uh, anything that anyone would like to maybe uh, mention? So once again, what we're going to do is we're going to put the recording onto the Facebook site and it will be there free and will run for some time so that people who couldn't make it could still uh, go there and uh, watch and listen. Please do let them know. Thank you for doing that. And uh, I believe we have a comment. Okay, um, someone wants to know, um, apart from ChatGPT, uh, what are some of the available AI tools? Honestly, there are so many. This is from uh, Bishop Kingsley. Um, there are so many. I, I, I have lost count. But the important thing is that you know what it is you want to do. So if it is generating text, then you can still go for ChatGPT, Cloud AI, and some of these, they call, they call them the um, generative AI. They are good at churning out uh, texts. Uh, uh, Prof. Inkari, you are welcome. Uh, We're glad you could join us. And um, But if we're going to list all of the AI that is available out there, um, some of them are purely for those who write computer code. Uh, so they give AI some idea of the new uh, kind of computer code that they want to write, and the, uh, the artificial intelligence produces it for them. Um, there are others who um, are graphic designers. Uh, they tell um, the, the particular AI that they are using um, give me a picture of a ship sailing in a storm uh, with somebody standing on the top uh, or whatever, and an AI will design that for them. There are others who maybe are editing sound or, or, or video, and they, they give. And so it, it really depends on what you want to do. So um, we're back to the, 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 the thing that we talked about at the beginning, particularly as senior leaders. We need to have um, very clear definition, very clear parameters of the tasks that we want to give to AI and what outcomes we want to get from those tasks. And using those criteria, we not only select the machine, the AI machine that we want to use to do those tasks, but we also are able to give clear instructions and to vet the outcomes. And if we follow those kinds of processes, then we are likely to come up with something that is usable and beneficial. Thank you for the question. Much appreciated. Okay, we're going to- Thank you to your eminence. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm very satisfied with the answer. <laughs> You're very welcome. Thank you. Um, so part two, we're talking about a little bit about the challenges. Um, there are a lot of fears about people are going to lose their jobs. The machines are taking over, particularly low-skilled workers. Um, it's not quite like that. If we look at the past uh industrial revolutions, what really happens is that eventually the machines augment some of the tasks and those who are able to utilize um, the uh, help that the machine brings, um, they always gain from the technology change. What we need to do is to keep informed, particularly if you are still in the job market, um, 
I guess most of us are, though some of us might have been getting to sell by date by now. Um, it's important that you keep getting trained. And actually, there's no end to learning. I've done at least half a dozen courses this year uh, myself. And believe you me, um, it will even help to keep your mind and brain very sharp. But always be looking at what skills do I have? How can I develop those skills so that they could remain relevant or I could develop from them into something that could still remain relevant even in the uh, uh, age of AI or the season of AI? Bias and fairness. Now, this is a problem um, with AI. Um, <clears throat> you've probably heard about this. People have been talking about it, that AI systems perpetuate or amplify social biases. Now, why is this the case? It happened initially because when these machines were being trained, nobody had the massive data to train them with. So they went to the internet, they went to online libraries, anywhere they could get masses of knowledge, masses of information to pump into these machines. And if you look at what the knowledge that is available out there, it favors the victors of history, it favors the rich, it favors uh, the Western nations and the white Caucasian uh, races that have, or ethnicities that have been part of the development of those empires and those nations, and so on and so on. A lot of the uh, books, uh, history books and so on that, that uh, are out there um, have, have all uh, got some of the old thinking of yesteryears inside them. And so when all of this was pumped into these computers, um, it created a problem that the baseline of knowledge in many of these things is repeating certain ideas that honestly, uh, the world needs to have moved on from. And we're going to see some of that in a, in a moment. Um, so gradually, uh, people are beginning to look at ways of training AI for their own nation, training AI for their own people. I mean, this is a serious, serious red flag for nations um, in Africa, in Asia, and so on, that the AI systems that people are coming to sell to you are not necessarily ideal for you and for your environment. In some cases, they might be um, people will say, oh, well, in banking, you know, it's just numbers. No, it's not just numbers, it's people. And uh, I think we're going to hear a bit about that in a minute because um, the assumptions of an AI system that is working um, in the city of London, the assumptions of the level of credit and uh, how many houses or what quality or, or how much uh, uh, the house of somebody might be worth and all kinds of things. There's a, a thousand or a million things that um, could be wrong if you move that AI system to another country and to another city. So these problems are very real. And um, the sooner we begin to develop uh, universities and um and other institutions to begin to produce or at least adapt the AI systems um, to, to suit the environment where they are to be deployed, the better. Um, it's not, it's good that we have the uh, African Union uh, legislating, but the legislation by itself is not gonna solve this problem. It's going to take some very serious practical action, which will need investment. Um, one of the things that is helping is that building AI now is getting cheaper and cheaper. When they started, and there are some really big guys out there like um, um, Amazon and um, Microsoft and uh, Meta, Facebook uh, people and so on. But working with AI is becoming cheaper and cheaper and in the next few years, it will be a lot more easier for a nation or even maybe a state or within 
uh, a nation to pick some of this technology and make sure that it is actually working for that environment, um, not just exporting money um, to somebody somewhere. Also, we talked about the microchips that are being produced now. Um, there are new brands and new breeds of microchips that are being produced. Uh, some of you may know that in the past 40 years or more, almost all of the microchips in the world have been produced by just a handful of people, handful of companies. It's a very tight monopoly. Uh, that is changing. And this is another area where Africa and other places need to be uh, have their wits about them so that you start producing some technology that not only works for you but it is made by you you control it and how does this machine process information you have designed it to process the information in the way that you need that information to be processed because you have unique needs and um you have outcomes that require certain things to be taken into account, which some of the systems that are being shipped to you are blind to some of these things, totally blind to them. When we say edge computing, we're talking about um, pushing some of the um, pushing some of the needs of computing out to the edge of the network. Uh, what do we mean by that? At the moment, artificial intelligence is carried, it is processed by major data centers. These are huge pieces of real estate. Um, some of them are in places that you wouldn't imagine that any uh, major industry is there. You think it's just a building, but it's full of computers. I know there are one or two now in Nigeria, um, certainly in Ghana. And again, if you read that little red book, you will learn more about some of those things. Uh, the problem has been, again, that the environmental footprint of those industries is huge. AI is one of the most polluting industries in the world. The amount of electricity, the amount of uh, plastics and hardwares and all kinds of things, uh, hard metals and so on, that go into um, keeping AI and, and other telecom and computing systems going is huge. And then it needs massive input of electricity, which is why in some places it might be a little bit difficult where electricity is, uh, to say the least, epileptic. However, what the uh, engineers have been talking about recently, because uh, lighter um, microchips that can process information are becoming available, is that we could split up this processing and allow um, people who are far away from the data center to do some of the processing themselves. That is what we term edge computing. You have the center of a network, you have the edge, outer edge of the network. So that is something that might um, become more relevant as we go along. Okay, uh, I'd like to introduce you to Joy. Joy Bualamwini, uh, very interesting young lady. She is on a mission and you'll hear her in a moment. Um, she is an MIT graduate, very uh, intelligent lady uh, who is really making waves. I have her book here on masking AI, which I bought some time ago and I told her about it. And I've said, if you ever come to Manchester, come and see me. Here's Joy. Two, two things that I like, dancing and dogs. And I made them into a successful business. Hi. Okay, let's skip that. Mm -hmm. Hello, I'm Joy, a poet of code on a mission to stop an unseen force that's rising, a force that I call the coded gaze, my term for algorithmic bias. Algorithmic bias like human bias results in unfairness. 
However, algorithms like viruses can spread bias on a massive scale at a rapid pace. Algorithmic bias can also lead to exclusionary experiences and discriminatory practices. Let me show you what I mean. Hi, camera. I've got a face. Can you see my face? No glasses face? You can see her face. What about my face? Well, I've got a mask. Can you see my mask? So how did this happen? Why am I sitting in front of a computer in a white mask trying to be detected by a cheap webcam? Well, when I'm not fighting the coded gaze as a poet of code, I'm a graduate student at the MIT Media Lab. And there, I have the opportunity to work on all sorts of whimsical projects, including the Aspire Mirror, a project I did so I could project digital masks onto my reflection. So in the morning, if I wanted to feel powerful, I could put on a lion. If I wanted to be uplifted, I might have a quote. So I used generic facial recognition software to build the system, but found that it was really hard to test it unless if I wore a white mask. Unfortunately, I've run into this issue before. When I was an undergraduate at Georgia Tech studying computer science, I used to work on social robots, and one of my tasks was to get a robot to play peekaboo, a simple turn-taking game where partners cover their face and then uncover it saying peekaboo. The problem is peekaboo doesn't really work if I can't see you, and my robot couldn't see me. But I borrowed my roommate's face to get the project done, submitted the assignment, and figured, you know what, somebody else will solve this problem. Not too long after, I was in Hong Kong for an entrepreneurship competition. The organizers decided to take participants on a tour of local startups. One of the startups had a social robot, and they decided to do a demo. The demo worked on everybody until it got to me, and you can probably guess it. It couldn't detect my face. I asked the developers what was going on, and it turned out we had used the same generic facial recognition software. Halfway around the world, I learned that algorithmic bias can travel as quickly as it takes to download some files off of the internet. So what's going on? Why isn't my face being detected? Well, we have to look at how we give machine sight. Computer vision uses machine learning techniques to do facial recognition. So how this works is you create a training set with examples of faces. This is a face, this is a face. This is not a face. And over time, you can teach a computer how to recognize other faces. However, if the training sets aren't really that diverse, any face that deviates too much from the established norm will be harder to detect, which is what was happening to me. But don't worry, there's some good news. Training sets don't just materialize out of nowhere. We actually can create them. So there's an opportunity to create full spectrum training sets that reflect a richer portrait of humanity. Now you've seen it in my examples how social robots was how I found out about exclusion with algorithmic bias. But algorithmic bias can also lead to discriminatory practices. Across the US, police departments are starting to use facial recognition software in their crime-fighting arsenal. Georgetown Law published a report showing that one in two adults in the U.S., that's 117 million people, have their faces in facial recognition networks. Police departments can currently look at these networks unregulated using algorithms that have not been audited for accuracy. Yet we know facial recognition is not failed proof and labeling faces consistently remains a challenge. You might have seen this on Facebook. My friends and I laugh all the time when we see other people mislabeled in our photos. But misidentifying a suspected criminal is no laughing matter, nor is breaching civil liberties. Machine learning is being used for facial recognition, but it's also extending beyond the realm of computer vision. In her book, Weapons of Mass, destruction. Data scientist Kathy O'Neill talks about the rising new WMDs. 
widespread, mysterious, and destructive algorithms that are increasingly being used to make decisions that impact more aspects of our lives. So who gets hired or fired? Do you get that loan? Do you get insurance? Are you admitted into the college that you want in to get into? Do you and I pay the same price for the same product purchased on the same platform? Law enforcement is also starting to use machine learning for predictive policing. Some judges use machine generated risk scores to determine how long an individual is going to spend in prison. So we really have to think about these decisions. Are they fair? And we've seen that algorithmic bias doesn't necessarily always lead to fair outcomes. So what can we do about it? Well, we can start thinking about how we create more inclusive code and employ inclusive coding practices. It really starts with people. So who codes matters? Are we creating full spectrum teams with diverse individuals who can check each other's blind spots? On the technical side, how we code matters. Are we factoring in fairness as we're developing systems? And finally, why we code matters. We've used tools of computational creation to unlock immense wealth. We now have the opportunity to unlock even greater equality if we make social change a priority and not an afterthought. And so these are the three tenets that will make up the encoding movement. Who codes matters, how we code matters, and why we code matters. So to go towards encoding, we can start thinking about building platforms that can identify bias by collecting people's experiences like the ones I shared, but also auditing existing software. We can also start to create more inclusive training sets. Imagine a Selfies for Inclusion campaign where you and I can help developers test and create more inclusive training sets. And we can also start thinking more conscientiously about the social impact of the technology that we're developing. To get the encoding movement started, I've launched the Algorithmic Justice League where anyone who cares about fairness can help fight the coded gaze. On codedgames.com, you can report bias, request audits, become a tester, and join the ongoing conversation, hashtag codedgaze. So I invite you to join me in creating a world where technology works for all of us, not just some of us. A world where we value inclusion and center social change. Thank you. Very interesting young lady, and uh, there's a whole group of them who work together, and I think they're great, and I'd uh, love to encourage them any way that I can. Okay, uh, just a couple of maybe questions, comments from that, possibly, anybody? <clears throat> Well, at the very least, it could make you think about some of the AI programs that are being run, uh, maybe outside of Europe and America. Where were they written? Written by who? And for what purpose? And now they are supposed to be serving in a completely different environment. Is there real equity in that? It is food for thought, certainly. Some other AI issues, privacy and data rights, who owns the data? One of the things I asked in that book I showed you earlier when I wrote it, um, not many people are asking that, more are asking now. Uh, <clears throat> when some of these um, systems are sent around the world, they are collecting massive amounts of data from the ordinary people, everybody who uses a cell phone, wherever you live, is contributing a lot of data every day to somebody. Who owns this data? And um, who has the right to use it? Is it being exported somewhere? Um, and and um, a host of other questions. Which brings us to transparency and accountability. 
most of these types of technologies are not accountable. Even when they come into a space, they come into a country, they come into a city, they are at the behest of a chosen few. Um, therefore, there is always the risk that they may not be serving the many. We need legislation and we need action that helps ensure that there is greater transparency and accountability of such systems. This also matters in terms of, say, a company or even a government department and so on who acquire technology um, to be able to ask some of the right questions is really important. And this also brings us to the issue of security. Um, are some of these things that we're talking about also a security risk? On a personal level, on a national level, and also an organizational level, there are concerns also that if, as some predict, AI will become so existentially aware um, that it will go from generative AI to generalized AI, where it will have a general intelligence similar to that of human beings, that what might become of the relationship with humanity. Which brings us very neatly to the hallucination problem. You may have heard of this. It's been gathering some, um, some attention recently. And some of you may have noticed this. I have seen this happen myself because I do have an AI system that I use. And there are instances where the AI system will produce garbage or it will start repeating itself just using slightly different language, saying the same thing over and over again, because it has run out of something to say, but because it has been programmed to get to a certain number of words or something or whatever, it just keeps on going. And this has huge implications um, for all kinds of applications of AI. If you use an AI system, please be on the alert for this. And you cannot use AI without being a good editor. You must be able to spot what is going on um, when you're using those systems. So here's uh, someone who's going to talk a little bit about AI hallucinations. It's a very short video. It's obviously their own viewpoint, but let's see if we can How do artists listen. Do such extraordinary work. You might say that the key component is the imagination. What if I told you that for AI, imagination and hallucination walk hand in hand? To be able to create poems or code, a model has to fill in the gap by drawing from its pre existing knowledge, sometimes leading to creative or unexpected results. Because of this ability, AI can be used to create absurdly beautiful images and new data for training models. But there's a catch. Sometimes AI's imagination can cause it to hallucinate completely incorrect information. Think about hallucination as AI not being self-aware enough to separate what is imagined from what is grounded in truth, leading it to confidently assert something that is doubtful. With good reason, hallucination is a problem engineers are trying to solve. So here is one major problem. And if you are in a position of leadership or, or in, in any way, and you're thinking of bringing an AI system to come and do anything for you, beware, beware. Um, certainly um, there were some lawyers who, who brought an AI system um, the AI system created fictional cases that had never passed through any court with names of judges and all sorts of people and dates of when judgment was given. It was only when they went and back and checked, they realized that 
this was all total fabrication. So you really must be careful if you're going to use any of these systems. Check the output. You are responsible from it. As I say, no one from the AI company will come to defend you. There's another problem that if some of the AI systems are putting out rubbish or putting out biased information, then other AI systems are consuming that information. It becomes a kind of a cycle where garbage is feeding more garbage. So this is becoming a problem now. And um, well, a lot of very clever people are trying to find a solution for this. Some of the key priorities we need, transparency, we've talked about that, explainability for the ordinary average person to understand what is going on with AI around them. Fairness, bias mitigation. We've talked a bit about that. How do we put checks and balances to be able to have some kind of um, framework before AI is deployed in any particular context or environment. Privacy protection, we've just mentioned that as well. So these are some of the key issues. And how do we make this to be more of human AI collaboration? We don't need AI to come to take over, but we need these machines to help us in certain aspects of our work. We need safety and robustness. We need ethical frameworks. We need proper governance. And honestly, I would say that um, a lot of people, and this is not talking about Africa or Asia or anywhere, a lot of people in government circles, even in some of the large organizations that have been my clients in the past, many of their staff don't have the time and don't have the incentive to really go and study these things. So somebody comes along with, you know, a box of shiny thing, and um, before you know it, they've been convinced about what it can do and all of that. Several highly placed people have been speaking out. The, the, the chair of US Securities and Exchanges pointed out that the fact that the major AI systems, and you need to understand that when you talk about chat GPT and all of these things, they are not the AI. These are, they are an interface that allows you to use the brain power of the AI. All of these companies have um, contracts with the actual AI itself, uh, who are just a very few companies and a very few people who actually have the um computers that are doing the calculations and giving the answers. So each of these companies that is presenting something called AI to you has only been able to create an interface that allows you to send a question into that environment and get an answer back. Gensler is pointing out that this has be is becoming a single point of failure. When we had the, the recent crash um, IT crash um, in the States, the um, um, uh, CrowdStrike crowd strike, crowd um, crash, uh, I wrote an article, which is, it, some, some of you have read it, it, it's available on some of the academic websites, um, where I talked about single point of failure. Um, when I used to be more uh, involved formally in, in the IT world, these were things that greatly concerned us. What is a single point of failure? That is something that is so critical that when it fails, everything else around it also has to fail. And Gensler is pointing out that this AI of a thing that so many people are depending on is becoming a single point of failure, which if anything happens to the actual sources of the AI at any particular point, just as the CrowdStrike uh, incident uh, affected so many things, we could find ourselves in very big trouble. There is some developments in Africa. I thought I would chip this in because I knew there'd be people from the African continent here tonight. Um, there's uh, There's been a recent uh, artificial intelligence strategy um, uh, from the um, 
the African Union. Uh, the EU has also come up with quite a comprehensive AI legal framework. It's actually groundbreaking. Um, I don't think that it will be able to transport directly into Africa or Asia or anywhere, um, but some good ideas could be taken from there that could help to build uh, some similar kind of frameworks for other parts of the world. The lawyers, African lawyers, particularly the younger lawyers in Africa, have been meeting to talk about this. Um, this was their meeting recently. I'm not going to play much of it, but just for you to see what they're doing. I mean, this is great. You see these young lawyers uh, getting together, talking about AI and, and, and all of that. It's great. Excited from Lagos, Nigeria. I'm super happy. It's amazing. Great to join. Where are you joining us from? We've got someone from Morocco, Ethiopia, DR Congo, oh, South Sudan, fantastic. Rwanda, Togo, Zimbabwe, truly African indeed, truly African. I'd like to introduce someone who's actually in the room all the way from Uganda, and so I'm going to invite him to just come on stage. Um... Yeah, so uh, I really um, appreciate them, um, and... Um... I'm I'm really grateful to see uh, some of um, some of that kind of work going on. So I want to really commend some of the young professionals who are getting together and are doing uh, some of these things um, to, um, to to together. So I don't know if before we end the session, are there any um, further comments or questions? Thanks for the comments. I uh, uh, really appreciate that comment. Um, that's from His Royal Majesty King Bubaraye Dakulo, who has been with us. I kept a little quiet about his presence because I wasn't sure if he wanted to be announced. Well, please do stay in touch with us. Um, you can inbox me um, through the chat here. Um, you can email admin at digivertex. I'll pop that in the chat so that you can you can copy it. You can email me there uh, and get that to come up. And admin at um, digivertex.ltd. I will get that and be happy to continue the conversation with you. And hopefully at some point, um, we can take these uh, a little bit further. Uh, Prof, uh, Oyinkari, uh, happy to have you with us. Um, yes, uh, you have your hand raised. Please do um, speak to us. Yeah, greetings to everyone. Uh, I'm sorry I, I got the invitation um, rather late, but I was able to join in at a point when very critical issues were being um, highlighted. Um, actually, there's been this scare of uh, the AI uh, disruptions in the academic world as well as in industry. Um, I, I want to think that um, going forward with this kind of um, education and enlightenment, um, our people will be able to start looking inwards and doing things that will uh, twist the situation positively for the African, especially the mindset development. Our minds are really skewed um, negatively against ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think that you have done a very good job in this. Um, and I want to commend you. I hope that uh, we will repeat this type again so that I can also invite others to come listen and hear how we are being manipulated and being uh, used um, against ourselves. Thank you very much. I really appreciate this effort. 
Thank you so much for saying so. Very much uh, appreciate you being here with us. And again, I apologize. We had some technical problems. We, met, we were meant to be live on Facebook, um, but um, things were not quite working out. So we had to shift over here. And um, that meant that quite a few people um, were unable to move with us. So I'm sorry about that. But it's been a great time um, talking together. Is there anyone else who wants to say something? Um, you're free to do so. Um, and um, we certainly will take up your uh, uh, comment, Prof. Uh, we only do about two of these every year. Um, but perhaps we want to be getting some like minds together um, once in a while to um, talk about uh, a few things, you know, because um, there's uh, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. Okay, on that note, uh, I want to say thank you again for being here. It's been a pleasure. It's been an honor. <laughs> I'm Doye Taido Agama. They call me the Digital Archbishop. It's been my pleasure to have your company. God bless you and. Uh, Hope to see you and speak with you soon. Bye. God bless you too. Goodbye. Amen.